in my role of Chief of Realm 4, which sounds like a wild title, um, at ASU we operate under realms of teaching and learning. So Realm 1 are our campus students, which there's about 85,000. Realm 2 are our online students, around 93,000. Realm 3 is when we started putting four credit courseware on our MOOC platforms, partners like edX and Coursera. And then Realm 4 is education through exploration. So it's all of those technology tools and initiatives just to ensure that no matter what modality our students choose, they have what they need to be successful. And really, in the last couple of years, it's thinking, how do we make students explorers of their content, make them agents of their learners? And so there are amazing things happening across the university. There are so many people that fall in that Realm 4 category. But the one that I spend most of my time on is Dreamscape Learn. And so Dreamscape has um, been a project where we are bringing immersive VR experiences to life in what we started as our STEM, our specifically our biology programs. And so it's been so fun figuring mm -hmm. out how we bring these technologies to our students, how we make them more active in their learning, how they're excited. We're doing this through storytelling and an incredible partnership between um, us at ASU with President Crow and with Dreamscape Immersive, Walter Parks. So it's been wildly fun. And I feel like right now we're in a generation where students expect this. They're playing games, yeah. they're spending time in headsets. And so these are technologies and modalities that they want in their fun time of their life. And so why would we not bring it into their education time of their life to ensure that they're engaged and bought in and excited? So wildly fun, it's great, love it. So the area that you work in, right, the, you know, as far as using technology and education is highly immersive. Mm -hmm. So for folks who are not necessarily familiar with the technology and maybe even, uh, you know, they may have children who are in school or, or, or maybe they have relatives or neighbors or whatever, how does immersive technology impact education? Like what's the game changer there? Yeah, so what we've done is we've built these VR experiences where students, they still have their labs, they still have their lectures, they're actively engaged either on campus or online. But prior to doing that courseware, they do a quick immersive experience or even a 2D experience. We have 5,000 biology students on this Tempe campus nearly and almost as many in our online program. So we have a 2D version, we have a fully VR 3D version. But what it is, is it's going into these immersive experiences where you are the scientist, you are the explorer, you are going through these worlds and places where they explore. And what it's doing is it's creating engagement in the content where they want to persist through the rest of their curriculum. I think it's a dystopian future to think that we would spend all of our time in VR. I don't know if you've seen the movie Ready Player One, which feels a little wild. That doesn't feel quite right but figuring out how we use it to engage students at certain parts in time, putting them into this world where they are so fully deep in it that they, they feel like they're there, they're excited, they feel like it's a place that they visited, makes them want to do differently yeah. when they get into class. Make sure it's clear awesome. It's so, so let's talk about um, what has adoption been like, right? You know, so Dreamscape, um, only at ASU, mm -hmm. Uh, but just immersive technology in general, what has it been like as far as adoption across the education landscape? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, let me answer the general landscape and then I'll answer ASU okay. specifically. So the general landscape, landscape, I feel like a lot of people are starting to talk about it. They're playing with it. They're figuring out ways to do it as sort of a, an additive piece to their curriculum or a mm -hmm. way just to have fun with students. And I feel like you're seeing a lot of stuff in the news. NSF is starting to do grants around immersive technology. So it's definitely getting, it's getting hype and people are spending time in it and figuring out how to use it. I think with ASU, we chose to do it in a very different way, specifically with Dreamscape. We built it into the curriculum where students have to do it. And so students do the VR portion and they still attend their class. And without doing the VR portion, they're sort of like, it, it sets the whole stage for the rest of everything they do in class and in their what we call mission memos. And so because we've built it in, students aren't as likely to do things just for fun. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but like I taught middle school, high school, college students don't really want to do extra course, extra courseware. So we were so deliberate about building it in as part of the courseware, things that they get points for, things that all of the curriculum is surrounded around so that they want to be part of it, so that they mm -hmm. want to do it. And we've seen incredible learning outcomes where the more times they go to VR, the more present they feel in VR, the better they do in their classes. So very deliberate choices were made by the team um, that set it up like this. And so our adoption therefore has been really good. Um, we officially launched it just this last May, 2022. So we did fall, I'm sorry, last May, I meant to say last fall, 2022. We did fall, 
we did spring, we did summer, and we've already had over 12,000 students go through. So adoption for us, because ASU is huge, um, has been pretty powerful, pretty impact impactful, a little bit wild to yeah. think that we've had this many just biology students do these immersive experiences, you know, nine times throughout the semester. Um, it's been very fun. So I, I want to make sure that we acknowledge the fact that you said you taught middle school? I did. High school? I taught just middle school. Okay, just yep. middle school. Yeah. Okay. So that means you're like legit, right? You're, you're, I mean, no, really. That means you understand. You can teach middle school. You can do anything. Yeah, you've been there. And so you're actually marrying your experience mm -hmm. of being in the classroom. Yeah. And I think for me, I mean, I only taught for a short stint. I was very mm -hmm. young and lots of lessons <laughs> learned in that. Um, but I will say, I think for me, even more, I constantly think back to the fact of like, this is the upcoming generation. And, you know, I'm, you know, when I taught 10 years ago, this is like, we had to find ways to engage students to keep mm -hmm. them captive in their classroom. And so when we now have students that are going then into high school and into college, and with the how prevalent all of these tools are becoming, phones, social media, things like the Oculus yeah. headsets, we have to figure out how to bring that into their everyday life. I don't think I ever want to see it as a replacement. I don't want to see students and kids spending so much time in it but a good amount that engages them and continues to draw them in is where I hope that people continue to find the sweet spot. So I um, participated in one of the biology classes, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so tell us about that, because I'm thinking that helps accelerate learning. It's, you know, starting muscle memory really early with some of the things that they may do if they pursue their careers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for us, we started in biology and like I was kind of mentioning, students have a series of, um, we, we've built six modules in the topics of cell biology, community ecology, population biology. And so students will do a quick 15 minute VR experience prior to still going to their three hours of lab each week. Mm -hmm. And so in the first act of the module, they will go in and they'll be presented with some problem. And when they go back into lab, they're given a mission memo where this AI keeps talking to them. and says, okay, we need to form, we need to build models and form three hypotheses about what could be wrong with this creature in this fantastical world. And then they go back in to VR for 15 minutes the next week. They are testing all of their hypotheses. Usually we throw in some sort of curveball just to keep students uh, on their toes. So I knew all this, but I didn't know this. And so then they go back out and they are reformulating their thinking and developing some sort of re resolution that they go in and deploy the next week in the third act of VR. And then when they come out of VR the third time for that module, they then have to apply it to real world scenarios. So we built everything in this fictional space because we feel like it levels the playing field mm -hmm. for students. We at ASU measure ourselves by who we include, not who we exclude and how they succeed. And so when we have students coming in from all sorts of different backgrounds and populations, we wanna make sure that just because you went to a STEM high school or your mom happened to be a biologist, that you don't have an advantage over other peers awesome. in your class. So by building it in this fantastical world, nobody's been to the alien <laughs> zoo. You can't Google the answers, but we can present novel problems where they can solve it for these creatures. And then if we've taught them the just-in-time skills we've needed, if we've supported them and scaffolded their learning, they should be able to apply it to a real world scenario. And then that's the sweet spot if we have done it right. And I will give you a little, little uh, preview that the learning outcomes are showing really great things. So when we think about immersive technology and especially how it's happening here at ASU, how does accessibility play into that? That's a great question. Accessibility has been a, a big challenge because like if you're building websites, like there are complete documented web standards for accessibility. Mm -hmm. Those don't exist for VR. Companies like Unity that are really forefront in this space are starting to think through these things, but there's just no rule book, no guidebook, if you will, on how to do this. And so our sales office, our accessibility office has been incredible uh, partners along the way of helping us think about these things. How do we make a colorblind mode? How do we make a closed caption mode? But I will tell you, there are lots of places that we're still navigating and we have to figure it out because um, it's tricky. There are, there are a lot of things we want to make sure that every student has the affordances that their um, peers have. And so some of those parts we're still working through. Well, it's good to hear that ASU, when we think about being inclusive, that we're really living that value because mm -hmm. you're already thinking about it, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Which is awesome. Staying, staying uh, number one in innovation for a reason. Yeah. Where do you think we will be even five years from now when it comes oh, to gosh. technology? I have no idea. It is so wild to me to think about how fast everything goes, how quickly new headsets come out. 
it's wild to think where we could be in the next five years. I, I don't think I could predict it if I could, but I would love to see that we've built this into more content areas, that we've branched outside of STEM and we've tried it in the spaces of humanities. Right now, as we finish up biology, we're building chemistry. Approaching. So you were saying, where, where will we be in five years? I hope that we've built lots of new content areas across all sorts of disciplines, that this is something that makes ASU an exciting place for students to come, to keep proving that we're at the forefront of innovation, that we're continuing to build technologies to ensure that all of our students can be successful here. So those are some things I hope to see in the next five years, but like how we'll build AI into this and what all of this will look like, man, I have no idea. Looking back five years ago, I would have never thought I would have been in a role where I'm leading immersive projects at ASU. So hard to say what five years from now will look like. Yeah, no, this, this has just been so amazing. And even when I have visited Dreamscape, I get excited for the students who are there. And again, I just think about, wow, like what the future will mm -hmm. be like, right? Yeah. So, so exciting. And I hope this continues to be a big reason to excite students to come to ASU. Um, because we're actually living out our charter. We're doing things that just feel so fun, so innovative, so cutting edge. And so I hope that students are just intrigued to come here to be part of that. I know it, it, it's very, very exciting being yeah. here at ASU. It is. Right? Yeah, lots of innovation happening. Um, and here we are driving. Well, we're Successfully, not driving. Successfully, but we're not driving. We're yeah. just passengers. <laughs> we're this passengers. is easy. <laughs> it's quickly how, it's funny how quickly I forgot that I'm like, in a car where a human is not driving it. Was what? there any time that you were tempted to speak no, to a driver? Please make sure huh. it's here before exiting. No, which is maybe concerning, but like at some <laughs> point I just blindly trusted. I was like, we're great. It's doing good. I trust it now. Give me snacks and a drink. And exactly. Keep